Hey, thanks very much. Very nice to see you all. Hi there. I'm Jen McPherson. I'm from Macquarie University in Sydney. Lovely to see you. I'm also my uh, co-authors. Danny, are you here somewhere? Uh, Danny, at the back. Danny, did you want to come down the front? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any questions, direct them to Danny. Okay. Two other co-presenters, though, uh, and that's Lee and Scott. And I would just like to ask you a little favour now. Could everybody give Lee and Scott a wave? They're watching in Sydney, so we'll give them all a wave. Okay, couldn't have done it without you, you guys. Okay, so here we are talking about student perspectives on data provision and use. Now, you've already identified yourselves as teachers. Um, I want you to be thinking about then what makes somebody good at your subject. Okay, because that's kind of at the bottom of what I'm talking about today. And in terms of a little bit of expectation management, you can see if you watched me trying to plug in the gear here, I'm not very technical, okay? So I don't really do technical stuff. Uh, and actually my background is in sociology, okay? And I haven't actually come across any other people who are kind of into sociology here, although we did have a, a kind of philosophical take on things this morning, okay? But the advantage of sociology, I guess, or the sociology of education is it gives you a chance to kind of stand back and look at things and ask questions. So I guess that's my approach. Okay, so basically, just quickly, what we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna introduce our study, which is, uh, uh, we ran a series of focus groups with students. And we asked them about the kind of data that they would like to have. But we did something a bit different with the analysis. So I'm gonna present that today and it's a bit, technical but in another way that doesn't involve chords. Okay, so basically I'd like to make a case for thinking about knowledge. Uh, I'd like to connect what our students said about data to standards within disciplines, standards for achievement, okay? And I'd like to also then present our framework, which you'll also find in the paper, which is a way of aligning data with disciplinary standards and practices. Okay, so as I said, we were asking students about their learning, what kind of data they'd like to have about their learning and why. And you've got to ask yourself the question, you know, what's the risk of being guided by what students want? Okay, and there are risks. Okay, so we think, we like to think that our study is distinctive in a few ways, and this is how it's distinctive. First of all, that we've got to focus on what students say, which is maybe not so common in the learning analytics literature. We've also got our lovely undergraduate researchers who were involved with the project from the start. That's Lee and Scott. <coughs> we're also different because we give a bit of a sociological perspective and we use some, or I've used something called legitimation code theory, which is a bit of a mouthful. Okay, we're also interested in knowledge as well as knowers and knowing. Okay, so this is part of a larger project. Uh, the chief investigator of the larger project is Danny sitting down the back. Okay, and the larger project was looking at student and staff perspectives on learning analytics. Okay, so we did some other things with our data and we kind of pulled together what it was that students said, what kind of data they would like to have, but that's not so much what I'm presenting here. So the student focus groups, uh, we had 33 participants. This is the breakdown. As you can see, mostly female, <coughs> mostly undergraduate, from the full range of faculties, but one at Macquarie, okay? The breakdown roughly represents the breakdown of faculties. We also now have a faculty of medicine and health sciences and no students from that. Okay, the, the focus groups ran like this. We introduced a definition of learning analytics. We asked a couple of questions. What data would you like to have? How would you like to receive it? We showed them some examples, different kinds of models, dashboards, uh, the ones listed here. And then we asked them what kind of data they'd be willing to share. Okay, now when sitting in those focus groups, which were 
jointly facilitated by Lee and Scott. It was interesting how lots of the students actually focused on time management and accountability. So this paper kind of asks the question then, what's that got to do with disciplinary learning, time management, accountability? Okay, so how can we better align learning analytics practices with disciplinary knowledge practices? Okay, <coughs> not just to support learning, but also to support students' contribution to their discipline. If you look at some of the recent literature on learning analytics, it talks about the idea that we need to ground learning analytics, which is about learning, after all, in educational research. So then comes the question, well, what kind of educational research do we mean? And I'm just going to look at a couple of basic influences on le student learning research. Okay, this comes from Tamsin Haggis. All right, we've got psychological research. Okay, cognitive psychology and approaches to learning. So we're thinking about how do individuals learn? There's some key words there, personality, ability, approaches to learning and so on. Then we've got sociological research. Okay, which is a bit more focused on the student experience. So what influences learning outcomes? What students' experience of learning? Some other key words here, transition, diversity, student experience, and so on. Okay, but we've got another influence on what happens in education, and that's cultural trends and value positions. Okay, these are the kinds of discourses like quantification, efficiency, accountability. Okay, so this is what underpins that idea of time management. <coughs> okay, so some key words there, peer learning, self-regulated, personalization, quantification. Okay, so those three questions that just came up then, something's missing. So we've got how individuals learn, what influences learning outcomes, what students' experience of learning. Okay, so legitimation code theory, which is what we've applied to our data, thinks about that missing bit of the puzzle. Okay, so we're not just talking about learning, but we're also thinking about what we're learning. Okay. So, <coughs> usually educational research is focusing on the learning end, thinking about knowing, thinking about knowers or learners, and it's kind of generic. Okay, but from a real sociology of education, which is where this uh, set of tools comes from, legitimation code theory, here it's interested in what's learnt, focuses on knowledge as well as learners, okay? Knowledge and knowers. So the idea here is that it's based on the kind of principles that drive knowledge production, okay? Which is not the same as knowledge reproduction in the classroom. They run on slightly different principles, but they're connected. Okay, so we link this back then to what higher education is all about. So we're thinking about initiating <laughs> students into the knowledge practices of knowledge societies. We're looking at critical engagement with disciplinary knowledge so that students can understand it, reproduce it, also create it. We're thinking about students' agencies, agency as professionals in their chosen discipline. Okay, so... Not all knowledge is equal in different disciplines, okay? It, there are kind of underlying principles that drive knowledge production and they're specific to disciplines. That's one of the kind of bases of what disciplinarity is all about. So legitimation code theory kind of pulls those principles apart to, to see what the nature of different disciplines is. Okay, and why is this important to us? Well, it's important because if we don't think about this in learning analytics practices, we're not really fully addressing the needs of students as disciplinary learners, okay? We're not thinking about 
students, but also the kind of principles of what drives knowledge production within disciplines themselves. Okay, so if we're recognising this within learning analytics, then we can think about practices that align with disciplinary knowledge practices and also standards of achievement. Okay, so thinking about your own discipline, what is it that makes someone good at your subject? Okay, so I've got a few questions there. You might, you need to learn special skills or knowledge, or you need to have like a natural ability. Maybe only people with natural ability can learn the special skills, or anyone can do it, no special skills required. Okay, those four things give us kind of four different categories and the different categories are shaped by these principles of knowledge building. The idea behind this is that we're thinking about not just what is valid to know but also who is an ideal knower. Okay, now here's where it gets a bit technical and complicated. We're thinking about these principles that drive those four categories. Within legitimation code theory, they're called very technical names. Ep epistemic relations or relations to knowledge and social relations or relations between knowers. Okay, so we can have different strengths of both. Strong, which is ER plus or SR plus or weak, ER minus. SR minus. So these are the codes that we've applied to our data. Okay, just some examples there of how those different strengths work in different ways is the comparison between science and cultural studies. Okay, science you can see ER plus, SR minus. Okay, strong on knowledge, weaker on social. Cultural studies, <coughs> the other way around, okay? Weaker on the knowledge relations, stronger on social relations, okay? And I'm kind of generalizing here. Okay, so you can see there that the strengths of knowledge relations is about uh, the, the types of objects of study and the, the kind of boundaries between them. In science, those boundaries are very clearly defined. Cultural studies, not. Very open, okay? In terms of social relations, in science, those formal kind of principles and rules are more important than the differences between the people, okay? In cultural studies, the other way around, okay? With those social kind of relations, much more important. Okay, so there we have those four categories that we talked about before. <coughs> Given names, knowledge code, knower code, elite code, and relativist code. I'll just go through them quickly. So the knowledge code puts the emphasis on specialized knowledge. Okay, examples, science and psychology. A NOAA code, emphasis on attributes of actors, okay? You need to have special kind of natural ability or feel, okay? That could be a, you're born with it or you learn it, okay? Or it's socially constructed as in uh, gender kind of relation. English and media, a couple of examples. An elite code has both, okay? So you need natural ability to be able to learn the skills like music. Relativist code, neither apply, okay? Anyone pretty much is able to be successful in history. That's not to say, to diminish history in any way, it's just that in terms of the uh, standards for achievement are more open than say in an elite code. Okay, so you can map them out on a Cartesian plane. We've got our four categories here. 
epistemic relations going this way, strong to weak, social relations going the other way, strong to weak. Okay, the important thing is though that although I've just presented that as being something quite fixed, it's not that fixed. Okay, they're tendencies rather than absolutes. Okay, they're, they're actually tendencies that apply more to knowledge production. Okay, but when we get to, you know, we, what we learn as physics is not actually physics, what we learn in the classroom. Okay, it goes through this other process where it's kind of repackaged as curriculum and then reproduced in the classroom learning and teaching. Okay, so those, that repackaging and recontextualizing in the classroom kind of changes the nature of the original subject itself. Okay, so the other thing is that things can switch over the course of a program as part of this process. Okay, so what you learn maybe in first and second year of a degree might not be the same as what you do at the end. Okay, maybe you're focusing more on kind of academic knowledge at the beginning of your degree as you get towards graduation, at least in an Australian context, at our university, uh, particularly in my faculty, which is business and economics. We're looking more at professional capabilities as students are about to graduate. Okay, so what are the implications then for learning analytics? Okay, these are important because they define what we mean as success. Okay, success means different things in different disciplines because of this. It also affects the way we learn and teach in different disciplines, what we expect from students in terms of their participation, the standards that we set for achievement for students, and importantly, and this word's been coming up a lot during this conference so far, our proxies for learning. Okay, what is it that we're plugging into an analytic system that we mean as learning? Okay, I've, I couldn't get an arrow to work. I, as I said, not that technical. But I wanted to show that these are influences on knowledge reproduction. Okay, so we've got this other thing happening here that's important for us to think about. And that is the extent that we're shaped by these kinds of drivers, quantification, <coughs> personalization, and so on, which are not disciplinary, they're generic. Okay, so we put these ideas into practice in examining then what students said about data in our focus groups. So we looked at three areas curriculum, pedagogy, and assessment. Okay, and we used a framework that came from Rainbow Chen from her thesis, which basically puts these things, curriculum, pedagogy, and assessment. We've got epistemic relations and social relations. So we wanted to get a kind of map of <coughs> trying to categorize the different things that students said about data according to this. Okay, so I'll just quickly then take you through each category and just to kind of guide you because it's a bit complicated to get your head around. We're going to do the first one first, okay, which is curriculum. So we'll look at each one in turn, epistemic relations first, then social relation. Okay, so what students said about data and curriculum in terms of epistemic relations, so we've got strong epistemic relations at this end and weaker at that end. Okay, so at the strong end, we've got data that emphasizes content knowledge as defining the curriculum. Okay, data that helps in finding resources that build understanding of key concepts is an example. Data that su supports exam preparation. Down at the other end, we've got data that downplays <coughs> this idea of content knowledge, okay? <coughs> Perhaps data on graduate destinations, that was quite popular among students. Then interested to know, okay, so a student who got that job, what units did they want to do? I want to do them, okay? Whereas at this end, it's more structured, okay? And the curriculum choices that you're making 
are much more prescribed. Okay, in terms of social relations, again, we've got plus at this end, minus at that end. So at the plus end, data that emphasises personal experience, preferences and opinions. Okay, so here we've got then data on popular or useful resources and recommendations on subject selection based on performance, your own performance, interests, similarity of, of experience, popular study pathways. At the other end, we didn't actually have examples of data there, but we had students expressing doubt about that kind of data and whether that was actually going to be any kind of meaningful to them. Okay, so... The next stage then in the framework, pedagogy. Same thing we're looking, this time, epistemic relations, the teaching of content knowledge rather than structuring content knowledge as curriculum, and here, personal dimensions of learning. Okay, so same deal, for epistemic, Relations at the strong end, we've got an emphasis on content knowledge and also procedures for disciplinary learning being explicit to students. Okay, but at the other end, still we're about content because we're thinking about epistemic relations, but procedures for disciplinary learning are implicit. So that's the key difference between these two. Implicit procedures, explicit procedures. So here we've got data that emphasises study habits that are specific to a discipline. And data on other students' use of discipline-specific resources. At the other end, things that are kind of generic to any discipline, okay? Things that you have to complete, Data that says these are the things I've done or these are the things I need to do. Now, final category here on pedagogy is social relations. At the plus end, data that condenses learners' choices about how to study. Now, this is where that whole time thing came in. Okay, lots of students, no matter what discipline, were talking about having this kind of data. It's the Fitbit idea, okay, that you've got something that's kind of makes what you do measurable. And if it's measurable, it must be real, okay? So I'm measuring myself against myself, okay, and I've got a graph that shows it, therefore it means something. So here we've got data that supports time management or scheduling, data on what other students do, like class attendance, lecture downloads, time spent on resources, data for also for, for finding other people who have similar interests to you. At the other end then, we've got the same sorts of things but linked to some kind of external standard, which is what high achieving students do. Okay, so time spent, study strategies and study pathways and so on of high achieving students. In our last category, assessment. The key differences here in epistemic relations is the explicit evaluative criteria. So here we've got data that is personalised, but with reference to things like marking criteria, learning outcomes. At the other end, those kind of evaluative criteria are downplayed. We've got interventions based on performance, uh, direct interventions, or more passive kind of indirect interventions. Then, finally... In social relations, we've got 
students' sense of like their own beliefs are important in evaluating what's valid or data that compares a student to the cohort. So here's students' beliefs about assessment criteria and academic success. Again, this is not examples of data in this category, but more doubts. In the other category, data that allows for individual comparisons with the current cohort or previous cohort. Okay, so I guess in terms of where we're going with this is really just to generate ideas, generate critical reflection on what learning analytics practices actually do. To think about the idea that they're not neutral and what are our responsibilities as agents, when what, what are we doing through how we collect, analyse and recontextualise different kinds of data, okay? And what do we do about, you know, to what extent are we driving what we do through these external discourses like quantification, efficiency and accountability? Okay. So, I think I'm coming right up to the end. So, thanks very much. So Not sure that I... Good time for questions? Or? How, how much time do we have? Oh, we have like six, seven minutes for questions. Oh, yeah? So. Okay. Excellent. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, it's very interesting, especially that you mentioned a uh, specific point about pedagogy um, yeah. and how to consider, start considering uh, to get evidence that can be mapped back to, 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 to the pedagogy. However, mm -hmm. I was a bit confused. Um, I don't know if you can explain a bit more because my understanding is that the, the pedagogical approach, sometimes uh, at the institutional level, there are some commitments in the, mm -hmm. in the approach because the assessment and yeah. the other elements. But then the pedagogical approach also varies across um, lecturers, let's say, mm -hmm. or, or course um, managers <coughs> or designers. Or yeah. So there are decisions there as well. Mm -hmm. And the kind of analytic, well, maybe I didn't understand that properly, where about the evidence, like pathways that, that mm -hmm. students are doing, so kind of evidence of the actions that students are Mm -hmm. So how to map that back to uh, pedagogy, like um, that is more, uh, not necessarily that described in, in terms of actions that are already mm -hmm. in the past, but a, an approach to learning, based mm -hmm. in specific tasks, or, um, or even paradigms to educate mm -hmm. students. Yeah, I don't know if you can um, explain that, how, how that is going to be related. Yeah, I guess what we're looking at here, though, <coughs> is is data that supports those kinds of things is exactly, as you're saying, shaped by all those other things going on. So I guess the question then becomes, to what extent are we using data that supports the kind of essence of our <laughs> disciplines? And, to, and this doesn't just apply to learning analytics, it applies to learning and teaching in general, okay? And that is, you know, you've got all those other things going on, as you say, but fundamentally, we've got the question of what is it that drives the production of our disciplines. Okay, so I guess I, I can't give you an answer to what kind of data we could use to support that. I guess I'm more asking the question and encouraging people to stand back and ask that question <coughs> to, you know, what agency do we have to kind of affect any of that? Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's a big question. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? <coughs> yeah. So I was curious when so I, I work in pedagogy and mm -hmm. teaching team as well. Yeah. And uh, many years ago we tried testing and reducing the composition of long class through the disciplines. Mm -hmm. And we found that uh, the disciplines that are enough because each teacher has his own conception mm. of his own discipline. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the case of Darwin and so mm -hmm. uh, that it was really a different world because of the 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I think that's an interesting question and how you approach that in terms of a discipline itself because, yeah, it's something that I didn't discuss here, but absolutely, we've all got our own understanding of how to teach, our own conceptions of learning and what it means. What, you know, are we thinking that learning is about acquiring information or changing as a person? You know, those, those are kind of fundamental to us and I'm sure all of us have different understandings there. But I guess the thing about analytics is that it's pulling together all of us, you know. It, it's got that capacity to condense multiple practices, okay, and put them together as data. So if at that level we're thinking about how we do that, then we've, that's where we're asking the questions. So we're thinking about, so what selections are we making here because generally, or at least it, at our institution, these things affect multiple people. So it's the decisions there that we're interested in. Yeah, I think it's a really important point to consider also. Thanks. Our last question? Well, I have a one last question. Uh, okay. Is, can you give us an example of, of how this well, imagine that I'm preparing some learning analytics stuff and yeah. I want to, for example, measure the learning of the students <coughs> while working in groups. How these different disciplines affect this design of this learning analytics? Can you give us an example of trying to put it on, down on earth? On yeah, okay, so maybe it? if we're thinking about teamwork mm -hmm. and how people work in teams, okay, the way what we expect from somebody working in a team in law might be different from what we expect from a team working in biology. So in a team in law, maybe we've got, uh, particularly if we're thinking about something that's more professionally oriented at that stage, we're thinking about, you know, those kinds of negotiation skills and so on that lawyers might need, okay? But biologists don't need those same kind of skills, okay? So the kinds of data that we might be collecting is different in nature, okay? Because it's targeting different stuff. Does that yeah, answer yeah. your question? So. Yeah? Thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jen. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Ian Scott.